It's perhaps one of the most addictive sensations imaginable. It provides some of the highest highs and the lowest of lows. In today's episode, we take a peek behind the curtain to explain a crazy little thing called love. My initial reaction is usually fear, and I'm sure a lot of people have that same, you know, worry. It's a defense mechanism, but it's that exciting, like, possibility. Monet Schlotterbeck is currently a media communications and journalism student at Fresno State. Like many people her age, she has experienced her fair share of love and loss. When you fall for someone, it's like you're in a world where you feel like no one really gets you. And when you meet someone who sort of taps into that part of you, it's, it's comforting. And I think when you fall in love with someone, I think, I don't know, it's just really great. I, I, it's a really good feeling. You get the butterflies and all you can think about is them. When you wake up, when you go to bed, you know, it's a good feeling. Sometimes things inevitably end. Um, it sucks. It sucks if you feel like you didn't see it coming or if you you knew there was a problem, but you thought that like you could fix it or you wanted to fix it, but it gets to a point where it's like, if you're the only one trying, then it just, it doesn't work. It sucks. I, I especially think, you know, again, from personal experience, when you don't get that closure from the other person and like you feel like there's still some things that need to be said or they just got the wrong idea, but it's like they won't give you the chance to talk it out, you wonder if if it really mattered or you kind of wonder, did that happen? And you ask yourself, I care about this person so much, like, will this pain go away or will I ever feel that, that exciting, can't live without you feeling for another person? And sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but when you do, you have that sense of relief again and excitement again. Well, you can't really disentangle all that stuff. Although much of our behaviors as humans can be explained through a chemical process, Dr. Martin Shapiro, a professor at Fresno State, explains why there's more to this addictive process than just simple chemistry. I mean, we do studies in neuroscience about the neurochemistry, or we record, record um, you know, the brain with MRIs and look at hormones, all in different types of um, love. I mean, the, you know, one of the most famous researcher in this is a woman named Helen Fisher, and she talks about three kind of stages. One is lust, another is attraction, and then attachment. And her idea is, because she does a lot of this neurochemistry stuff, is we it's have kind of different brain regions, different hormones, different neurochemistry all involved in those different stages, right? So while we're dealing with something that is extremely personal and uh, I think probably poets and artists would have a better, um, better way of describing this event than a biologist or a physiologist and neuroscientist like myself. But it is kind of fascinating that we do have these neural correlates that, that go with these different stages of love and, or, or different parts of a romantic attachment. Um, at f lust, which doesn't necessarily love or even attraction in, in those ways, I mean, it tends to be governed a lot by high levels of estrogen and testosterone. And, and both hormones are in males and females. And, you know, levels of testosterone tend to rise a bit when you are around somebody you're attracted to. A attraction part, the falling in love part, is, is I think one of the most interesting things because it resembles other neurological disorders. So, and, and poets actually write about this, about how falling in love is a form of madness, you know? And we've all kind of done it. We've all been witnesses to the changes that happen in the early stages of that. We can't sleep can't think about anything else, our diet changes, all these things happen. And these are, you know, part neurological. So some of the studies, and these are corollary stuff, during the attraction phase when you're falling in love, you got a lot of things happening in your brain related to things like the neurotransmitter dopamine. And some of the most addictive drugs increase dopamine, right? Cocaine, methamphetamine, opiates, alcohol, all increase dopamine on our brain. But when you see that person you fall in love with, you get the same increase in dopamine in the same areas of the brain. And so people talk about the fact that we get this sort of addiction, addiction to this person that we're falling in love with. You also see, when you look at MRI studies, a decrease in other parts of the brain that are dealing with 
us learning about negative emotions. So a part of the brain called the amygdala, right? So if, you, if you're scared of snakes and you see a snake, your amygdala is just firing at all, all sense. Get away from there, right? It's really, it's all about fear and learning fear and being negative emotions. Well, when you, if you put somebody in an MRI and you show them a picture of that person they're just falling in love with, the amygdala shuts down, right? It doesn't want those negative emotions. The frontal lobe, which is about reason and thinking and logic and planning, that also tends to get a little lower. In other words, don't think about this rationally. Don't think about negative thoughts. Just have that kind of motivating, craving thing that we see similar to these processes of addiction, that we get sort of addiction, addicted to the person. We also see increases in norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is our brain's adrenaline, right? So our heart races and, and our skin gets clammy and all those kinds of things that uh, happen when we're seeing that person we're falling in love with, right? We also, which is kind of interesting, and I think this one's a, a bit of a reach, but there's some good evidence, is that we also get a decrease in serotonin and, and decrease in the hormone, serot uh, the, the neurotransmitter serotonin is associated with people who are depressed, which affects eating and sleeping and other things like that. Well, we also, when we're falling in love, we get a decrease in serotonin, and we also see a lot of the brain activity and serotonin decrease in people who have a chronic obsessive compulsive disorder. And so we get obsessed and compulsive about this person we're falling in love with, right? And people write about this in ways of saying, listen, when you're attracted to somebody, you're really having to put yourself out there. It can be embarrassing, it can be humiliating, it can be terrible. So you gotta get a little crazy, right? You gotta get a little obsessive, you gotta, you got to get a little addicted to that person in order for this to, in order for you to overcome some of these, some of these problems that that you have of, of putting yourself out there. That said, you can't say, well, listen, I the reason I stalk this person is I have a neurological disorder called falling in love. We can't go that far. You now you're together and you've been together for a while. The dopamine levels kind of get back to normal. There's still some elevation of adrenaline and dopamine when you're first seeing the person, especially if you've been away from them for some time. But the serotonin comes back up. It's not a chronic, this falling in love is not a chronic condition. But we see other things happening in the body for long-term relationships. And those things tend to be hormones. These are released from the pituitary gland and they're released, uh, one's called oxytocin, one's called vasopressin. They serve a lot of functions in your body. So oxytocin is elevated slightly during orgasm, right? Oxytocin is, ele is elevated to produce milk and mammary glands. It, oxytocin is really important and when a woman is giving birth, all those kinds of things. And people talk about these two hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin, as sort of these bonding hormones um, that we bond to people through that and that's the sort of long-term stuff and we don't see that kind of oxytocin vasopressin decrease uh, over a long period of time. Roland and Carol Gerber have been married for over 31 years. Their love has endured the test of time through compromise and commitment. We had uh, college classes together where we helped professors with some of their busy work, basically. I started a conversation from there and I uh, helped her with a couple of things and because uh, she was widowed and it just went from there. I've been hurt. I know what it's like. But when you're hurt, it makes you stronger. You're a little bit wiser. You can separate the wolves from the sheep. You keep your head up, you keep your pride, and you keep your dignity, and you trust your gut. This is Ronnie Gerber, reporting for Fresno State Focus, Radio Edition.